Welcome to another episode of the Carry Trainer Higher Line Podcast. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Higher Line Podcast. I flew from snowy Chicago today down to be with Jeff Cahill of Tango Down. We're down in Tucson, Arizona. Thank you. We're in your, in your conference room today. So Jeff was kind enough to let us come in and we're going to poke around some of what they do and what they've done for years and get a, a little bit more of an inside scoop of, of who you are, uh, maybe how you got started in this. and. You got it. Well, yeah. thanks, Mickey. Number one, thanks for coming to Tucson. Thank you. It's quite a pleasure having you here. Appreciate uh, that. I uh, hope it's a little bit warmer than uh, where you came from. It's so, lovely. Uh, yeah. I've got a little bit of perspiration on me right yeah, now. All right, right, yeah. <laughs> you survived the flight. You didn't get did. the uh, COVID-19. So, no, no COVID. Uh, in pretty good shape. I went like this the whole way. Yeah, yeah. Smart, smart. You know, I was due to go to Iwa, and it was, it was canceled. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, it seems like the whole world's canceling out on everything, so... It's going to be an interesting uh, few yeah. months, but uh, but anyway, thanks for making the trip. So, uh, where do you want to start? What uh, what makes a guy get into making millions of little parts for guns? So you were telling me off camera, you are uh, an engineer by trade, uh, product designer, product designer. Yeah. Yeah. So what does that mean to the the viewer listeners? What's a what's a product designer? Well. Uh, designers pretty much shape the world, you know, uh, engineers will, uh, do the hard mechanics of it, but the, the designers are more the visionary hmm. uh, aspects of it. So, uh, uh, I went to school at art center in Pasadena. Uh, it's known for, uh, probably, uh, the best car designers in the world. Oh, cool. But they also have product design, photography, a lot of different illustration. A lot Is of there any big things. car designers names that like pop up when that schools? Oh, Chip Foose. I'm sure. Oh, there's sure. Them, right. Yeah, I mean, I there's a, a ton of people that, uh, 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 Pete Brock, uh, all just boy, it's the who's who. Okay. They've really gone to uh, art center in Pasadena and, and prior to that in Los Angeles. But, uh, uh, when it came to the firearm part of it, uh, I have four older brothers. My dad, growing up, that's all we did was hunt and shoot. Okay. Uh, and fishing. I wasn't so much into fishing, but hunting and shooting, I was all over that. So. Uh, and you grew up in California, right? I did. Southern California. So, uh, uh, as we talked earlier off camera, it's, it's a different place now. But mm-hmm. Once upon a time, it was uh, everything was there, and there was... Plenty of freedom. I mean, my uh, fifth grade show and tell was my 22 bolt action Winchester rifle. Awesome. I walked to school with that gun on my back, and it was. Uh, That's fun. You hear people say that all the time. When yeah. I went to school, I had a yeah. shotgun in my locker. Yeah, right? Yeah. And it was, you know, it was no active shooter, you know, call out on me or anything else. So, uh, you know, like I said, it was just a different point in time. So. Uh, in California, no. In doubt. California, yeah. yeah. That's so, cool. So, uh, anyway. Um, when it came to uh, you know uh, shooting and hunting and everything else, when you use something, any kind of product, um, you can always find the the flaws and mm-hmm. the fleas and 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 uh, just imagine how you can make it work easier, smoother, more efficient, things like that. So, uh, which is always a problem <clears throat> in this business when I hear somebody say, "Hey, I designed and I'm going to hand you an imaginary yeah. thing," and I look at it and I go, "What the hell is this?" Yeah, and it's a guy doesn't know anything about maybe shooting or tactics but it sounded like a good idea to yeah, him and he yeah. maybe had some engineering or capabilities to create yeah and so he made it and then yeah. thought why does nobody want this thing uh, yeah and that's that's what's good about design school because you know just because you have an idea doesn't mean it's a good one yeah you know i mean for example i mean you know we could uh screw an espresso maker onto the side of a gun but you know that's it's cool thing to pe- have i think some people have but right? did it really <laughs> solve a problem right, I mean, right there's more dire issues with firearms and things like that that you know uh that's where your focus should be and uh, it's basically solving problems and then if you solve a problem somebody's always going to be happy with that what if stuff it'd be cool i'm still waiting on my flying car i, I know you are too <laughs> yeah, i want one you know but is that break our heart every day no sure. we go on with other stuff there's more important things that we have to deal with so. Mm-hmm. so so what got you started in with tango down was there one particular was there one uh 
problem that you're like, you know what, I think I can make a solution for this and then that launched the product line? Or was it, I'm gonna start a company and make all kinds of stuff for guns? Cause now you make, how many SKUs do you have? Oh man, we've got so many SKUs, so many different products in so many different directions. We, you know, do pistols, you know, rifles, a lot of stuff. But to answer your question, um, years ago uh, in, the, in the 90s, I was uh, good friends with Reed Knight. Okay. So uh, I used to go out to Florida, visit with Reed, see what the, you know, he was the up and coming uh, golden child for, for SOCOM. You know, they were gobbling up anything that he could generate. And, uh, and so, I, you know, I talked to Reed about some products, you know, you know, how come you haven't done this? How come you haven't done that? And it's like, he really didn't have the expertise to go in that direction. He had an engineer at the time by the name of Doug Olson, who uh, did the heavy lifting when it came to a majority of his products. But he was uh, basically uh, anything metallic, he could deal with it. But when it came to injection molded parts and things like that, they, they, he wasn't too savvy on it. So, what would this have been was, like late 90s? Uh, uh, late? Yeah, actually late 90s. And then uh, at that point, so, uh, uh, and he suggested, well, you know, what do you got? What are you thinking? So I started, you know, uh, working on the first product, and that was our BG, what evolved into our BG 16 rifle grip. And uh, what set it apart was there was utility to it. Uh, again, trying to solve a problem. And then uh, first- One of those behind you? Uh, let's see, there's uh, that um, green rifle right there. Yeah, that one, well it's, yeah, the green grip one over there. The, oh, oh, the, the green one, got it, got it, got it. That was the- uh, Yeah, I've got one of these. Huh. That was the that was kind of the part. That yeah, this uh, this grip right here was the one that uh, uh, started uh, started the company. Basically, we had uh, uh, once I had two partners originally when we started the company. Uh, I ended up buying them out in about two thousand five, two thousand and six. Um, but that grip was uh, uh, once we had uh, shaped the outside of it to be dramatically better than a, the A16 mm -hmm. or M16 A2 grip at the at that point in time. Finger um, hook and all that jazz. Yeah, it's just a little more, uh, you know, it was more organic. It was just more comfortable to the hand. It wasn't this this slab-sided grip that the military is, always seems to come up with. Mm -hmm. But 9-11 uh, uh, had just happened and a lot of guys were running off to the Middle East and they were uh, stitching batteries into their shirts and everything else. They had no storage capacity for anything. Mm -hmm. uh, batteries uh, were always an issue and we thought, hey, we'll just put them into the grip. You know, it's, it's, it's on the weapon system. It's centralized. You know, we configured the inside of that to take any number of batteries that would, uh, um, you know, power their aim points or their uh, uh, weapon lights, uh, things like that. So, uh, and that became a big hit. And in fact, right out of the gate, H&K had uh, selected it for their uh, 416. So the first 5,000 416s that were in the country had uh, the BG-16s on them. So that kind of put it over the top. And still then, make uh, this part? Uh, we still make it, yeah. yeah. It's, it's still in our, in our catalog. That's awesome. And then, uh, yeah, that was the little, what we tried to do is make it as simple as possible. We have uh, just a urethane plug that you uh, load the batteries in, then you just uh, push it in and then Push it in and push it in. Snaps right in. Yeah, and then push it in all the way. Yeah, and then it's, you know, everything's flush mounted. You know, you access the batteries when you want it. It's urethane. You can't tear it. You can't kill it. Um, I think we had two return to us that were so mangled. I mean, the, the entire grip was mangled, but in the course of, of all this time, two grips have come years. back. Yeah, 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 yeah. Never broken off the gun or anything. So, so you started vetting your capabilities to make things for guns and then just thought, what next? You know, actually, uh, we certainly had a bunch of ideas in the very beginning, but then uh, in the course of that, you know, we started getting a reputation for stuff that didn't break. Mm. So then uh, uh, one day we, we came up with the uh, vertical grip. I erroneously, when you were talking about grips, yeah. that was the first thing that came to mind. Yeah, the uh, the only uh, when the with the SOP mod kit when that was first introduced to um, SOCOM and then Army, um, Reed Knight had a, a vertical grip on there, but it was very fragile. It had a little plastic pin that held it in place. Well, any kind of shear force, it would just knock the pin off. The grip would come sailing off the gun. Okay. So we were asked uh, 
to uh, make something that wouldn't break, and we did. And uh, then that became part of the SOP mod, the later SOP mod Block 2 kit. And then, uh, then we did the little stubby version that was, that was nice. Actually, that came from Dev Group. They asked us um, uh, if we could make a little stubby grip for their 870 breaching guns that wouldn't break. They were okay. running the nights, they were trying to cut them down and you know, kludge them together, but they were breaking and uh, they were really unhappy with it. So we did the little stubbies and that was a runaway hit. And then all of a sudden uh, the team guys are stealing them off the, the 870s and sticking them on their carbines and then the rest is kind of history. I mean, we just went into full production with them. How many years uh, ago was that? Oh, geez, Man, it had to have been uh, like 2000 and like two, three, four, somewhere yeah, in there. Yeah, three, four, somewhere in there. What's so. comical to me, and uh, like guys watching this that are younger than 35 or so, don't know ARs that don't have a full length tube, you know, unless yeah. you go short, sort one out or try to find one that's got a short handguard on it, or God forbid the split handguard, you yeah, know, nobody yeah, buys yeah. such things. But I'll see guys online comment, uh, like Dave Harrington, for example. Yeah. And Super Dave, yeah. St Super yeah. Dave still yeah. runs one of these. Yeah. And I'll see guys see a photo and they're like, oh, look at that idiot with that thing. Like, you know, he doesn't have his hand out there like he's supposed to. And I think, right. you know, what you guys aren't remembering is this was what all of those badasses went to war with. Sure. Because it fit the gun. It fit yeah. what was available at the time. And yeah. I still know a lot of guys. I've got a friend that just got out of fifth group. Yeah. And he's got one on his gun still. Yeah. He's sure. A, he's a little, I want to come back to that because there's another part on there I want to yeah. look at. But yeah. Yeah, um, and and it's funny because to your point, it's like, who could look at Super Dave and go, "Well, that guy can't shoot." Right, right. You know? right it's right, like, right. Uh, you know, so yeah, it's uh, it's pretty and, interesting. And things evolve and, yeah. and sure. change, and and like I was talking with Dr. Middlebrooks yesterday, actually, and he was talking about a, a specific uh, tier one unit coming to him about the same time frame saying, hey, can you figure out how to get some kind of tube on there to cover the, get the more of the barrel covered so we can get our hand out there farther? Yeah. Because Benny Cooley was shooting that way in matches and they said, right. you know, we want to do that. Sure. So he starts chopping stuff down and it, it like I think sometimes with the social media driven world, people forget how some of this stuff came to be, which is why I love having these discussions and yeah. putting it out there so, so well, folks sure. hear it. And it was like, you know, with the vertical grip, the stubby, what, what was uh, so practical and valuable is uh, a lot of team guys, it's like they'd muzzle thump guys. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, if they had to go in a room, they had to interrogate somebody, somebody was starting to get a little froggy, they'd thump them in the chest. It's like, dude, sit the hell down, you know? And uh, You're talking about one breaking off with any kind of force. Yeah, the and then you just I couldn't do that about. with anything else. I mean, it's just, uh, or weapon retention, man. If somebody tries to take your carbine, you know, you're coming through a doorway. It's like that, that stubby comes in pretty handy. I mean, man, you can lock down on that gun and just start using elbows and getting away from somebody. And, and these had storage in them too, right? Yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah. The, the cap unscrews and yeah. well, still do. Yeah. yeah, I've got these. The on. very first ones, we had to make them so quickly, we actually cut down... Uh, some existing grips and then bonded the cap in until we could get the mold finished. All with the threads yeah, and so, such. Uh, but the guys weren't too concerned about sticking storage in a stubby, but once we finished the mold and we were able to you know, get that feature back. So I don't know why. I always think of, of your brand and I think of uh, Glock parts. That's like okay. the thing that, I, that just is me. I don't know why yeah. I always think about that. Probably because um, I always put your slide lock levers on my Glocks. Yeah. And that was like, you know, okay, I ordered a new Glock. I got to grab one of yeah. those online and, and, and get it on there. When did you start doing that stuff? Uh, Larry Vickers and I formed up on that in um, probably around 2005, 2006. We started talking about it. You know, I'd gone to a lot of Larry Vickers classes. Uh, probably one of the best pistol instructors out there, along with a lot of other things. But, I mean, uh, his pistol work is pretty phenomenal mm -hmm. as far as instruction. So, uh and we, you know, as much as everybody loved the 1911, you know, I mean, uh, you know, he made a comment one time. He's all, dude, it's a Glock world. It really is. And we were seeing more and more Glocks in classes. And a lot of the same issues were popping up, you know, uh, with the pistols. And even though Glock was using Glock Perfection, uh, there was still, you know, again, we were talking about uh, a solution to a problem. Mm -hmm. It's like it was subtle little things, 
but it makes all the difference mm -hmm. on a pistol, you know. So it, it, it can turn, certainly take something good and make it great. Yeah. Uh, you know, just those little, little refinements. That, I'm sorry, I mean to cut yeah. you off. But. There's solutions other guys have done, for example, for the slide lock lever yeah. that make it such an obtuse part that now the opposite's happening where it's not that guys can't actuate it, they're actuating it when they don't want to. Yeah, exactly. The, the extended slide stop yeah. is where, you know, even Glock made a version of it. And it didn't really solve a problem. It just mm -hmm. shifted it somewhere else. And it's like, depending on the size of your hand, you were constantly bumping that extension and locking the slide back mm -hmm. with rounds in the gun. So not, not the healthiest thing to happen in a gunfight. Larry so. and you kind of worked some of these things out together. Yeah, it's well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that that partnership came from, hey, you know, could we do this? And well, from a manufacturing standpoint, absolutely. You know, it's what if we were to re not extend it but reshape it, so that just with one finger you can lock it up or down. You know, uh, actuate it up or down. So uh, um, we started making prototypes, and then uh, that kind of took off from there, and then. Uh, then it was like magazine releases, you know, with the Gen 3s, the, uh, that was the first gun that we started on with our partnership. Uh, uh, the magazine release on the Gen 3 guns were, was really sharp. Uh, the edges were very sharp. Um, wasn't comfortable to manipulate. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and a lot of times it was just too short. You know, the older you get, you know, the, the softer your fingers get. So older... Uh, speak, students in the class yourself, and stuff, they were just bro. having difficulty and they'd really have to shift their grip on the weapon to manipulate Get the, their thumb the and finger onto it. You know, and God bless the Austrians. I mean, they're, they make a fantastic weapon, but they don't really shoot, you know, com which like we Americans just, do. Which we were you know? just talking so, about. Yeah. yeah. I mean, a little, <laughs> you know, <laughs> European oh, I mean, magazine locks on the bottom and things like yeah, that. Yeah, in our community, we'll, yeah. you know, typically if we're doing a class or something else, we'll shoot more in a week. And those guys shoot in a lifetime. Sure. You know? They'll yeah, go out and, sometimes in just you know. a couple of days, then some of them do. Right. Yeah. So when it comes to bringing out the best and the worst of something, I mean, they're, they get the best on the, on the drawing board, but the worst of stuff only comes from reality and running the stuff in the real world. Yeah. And they, yeah, it's they not just, just about having the ability to push the button. Yeah. It's doing it yeah. under, under speed over and over again. Yeah. And oh, we make this out of the finest <laughs> steels, you know. We will hammer forge this to yeah, last exactly. forever. Exactly. You know, but it's like, yeah, well, yeah, that's great. But, you know, when it comes to stripping the mag out of the gun, guess what? You know? why, do you suppose, why do you suppose that after guys like you make these great modifications, they don't go, huh, and... Borrow it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, Glock is, uh, we, we've got a really good relationship with, uh, thankfully, because of uh, Larry's, uh, you know, juice in the industry and in his network and all of his connections and everything else. Uh, Glock was very pleased to have him support the weapon system and, and do improvements and stuff. And there's one or two products of theirs that they, you know, uh, looked very similar to ours, you know, and, and we take that as a compliment. Um, sure, if you got a company I mean, like that, that's yeah. I mean, luckily they kind of kept it on some very small items that weren't total mainstream. It was more law enforcement oriented things like that. But, okay. But uh, but you know, I mean, they have to listen to their customers too. I mean, you know, if if it comes to the bureau or something else, going, hey, this is pretty cool, but it's going to use a bigger mag button. They're not going to come to us to get that. I mean, Glock. Sure. The pressure's on Glock to kind of do something. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but when it comes to the general. Uh, civilian or commercial market, they they kind of let us do our thing, which is kind of cool. So on that note, like your base plate here, yeah, cool base plate, a little wider. Yeah, it's not anything super complicated. It's just a little bit more purchase, like on this forty-eight. All the, I'm not telling you this, but the viewer, yeah, just a little bit more purchase all the way around, so you can strip it out. How many people rip your stuff off every year? I mean, is it? Is um, it, is luckily, it like an ongoing battle. Um, recently, we had one company. I don't know if I could mention them by name or not. If, yeah, if you do and we don't like it, we can edit it. But okay. Um, uh, they blatantly copied the floor plate. And, Did they? Because I know I've seen stuff before, especially yeah. being like you know surfing through the internet yeah. or you know magazines. You see stuff. And the but the. But the topper was that they actually copied Larry's logo. Awesome. <laughs> right? <laughs> and instead of a VT, they put a G in it. And you guys probably know who I'm talking about. Nice. But, uh, 
right? So then uh, we had a little legal battle with them. Like and they, they just like made a mold of that sucker, uh, it was, huh? uh, Their first ones out, it was like, you got to be kidding me. I mean, it was, you know, and they were online just... Uh, uh, it was just, it was interesting. We got a lot of chuckles out of that, but, um, uh, in the end we figured, Hey, you know, it's our brand. We're the guys that came up with it. You know, uh, you know, our audience, our customers will always know it's us. Mm -hmm. They'll, they'll know who in, did the initial innovation and then they'll see who, uh, who the, uh, the copycats are. So that's, you know, we'd rather beat people in the marketplace than in a courtroom sure. as much as possible yeah, sometimes. Yeah. I mean, when they copied his logo, that's that was over the top. But, uh, so something had to be done there, but I think... Uh, um, yeah, in this modern world, know. that stuff happens so oh, often yeah. now. Yeah. That stuff happens so often. Yeah. It, it, this industry is pretty interesting. I was talking to somebody yesterday, and they're saying, back in the day, back in the day, and I'm like, I know how old I am. I know how old he, he is. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, you're not like, back in the day, what are you talking like? 2010 like that's not that long ago like there's right. stuff that's been going on for a long long time like what changes have you seen just in the the 20 something years that you've been at this uh, well i think the real innovation that's been uh uh prevalent in the market that you see in the marketplace today um such as high performance polymers you know and magazines mm. and pistol grips and everything else you know a lot of that uh the impetus for that was the first Gulf Wars. I mean, uh, you know, um, nothing uh, shows the need more than combat. So that's where really a lot of uh, the stuff that we see today, the benefits and everything else, all that was gener generated out of the absolute need back in the uh, first Gulf Wars. Okay. So uh, everything in the Middle East, you know, the uh, war against terror and everything was evolving at a, at a fast pace because, you know, Uncle Sam was there to buy it. And, and, uh, and it was always a lot of uh, groups that were operational in the middle of it that were generating a lot of information and data that was great for, for designers and engineers to okay. create latest products. So a lot of that stuff is, is kind of the, uh, the mainstay of what you see in the tactical rifle market and tactical pistol market today. So uh, and like optics, I mean, do you think we would be anywhere where we are today with optics and, and night vision systems and oh, yeah. lasers and thermal, if it, if it wasn't for the Middle East, oh, yeah. probably not. I look at so. photos, guys will send me, there's a guy that I, I am friends with that'll shoot me photos like uh, he posts something to Instagram and he'll send me a picture, check this out, uh, first deployment to Iraq. And he's got like a sling duct taped yeah. to his rifle because there yeah. was no oh. method for him to put the sling he wanted on, like duct tape oh. and you know bailing wire and stuff, and that's not that long ago. Yeah, I mean it was amazing some of the stuff that we saw that was initially running off to the Middle East. Yeah, and it was Super like, Dave hmm. talking about taping uh, a flashlight to his. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. dude. If it wasn't for uh, you know duct tape, I don't know <laughs> what yeah, yeah. we would have done, man. And I mean, it, just that's surefire exploded during. Absolutely, that running through all those caves and stuff in mm -hmm. Afghanistan, and oh yeah, it's just. Um, and it really, again, it speaks to America and our talent pool and uh, as far as getting new product and getting solutions up and running as quick as possible mm -hmm. and getting them to the warfighter. Mm -hmm. I can't think of any other country where that would happen. Yeah. You know, it's like we're so pro-military and we're so, it's just a part of our fabric, our personal fabric, our family fabric, everything else. And we just, you know, everybody's ready to jump to the chance to, you know, to how help make Department of Defense out. How do we make it better? Yeah. yeah. You were talking earlier, you just mentioned talking about like polymers and stuff. Your uh, AR mags, what did you say the specific name is for this? Uh, that's the ARC mag. ARC mag. Yeah. So what, why the ARC mag? I mean, I see there's an ARC to it, but. Well, it was uh, advanced uh, reliability combat magazine. Okay, I knew there so was going to be way more than something yeah, like that. Just, advanced reliability combat. Yeah. And uh, we were talking about, I asked like, why the construction and what am I looking at? And you were talking about, you've got a background in plastics and mm -hmm. molding and all that. And you're talking about some high level, uh, maybe not too high level, but high level compared to the average dude that buys something off the shelf and has no idea of the processes to get this plastic into a mold to make yeah. this happen. You want to talk a little bit about that compared to standard full length mags or no? Is that Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I'll, I'll touch on it. It's, uh, Again, you know, uh, trying to solve problems. I always try to look at something 
and think uh, a clean sheet of paper. You know, just because something's been done a certain way, especially the gun industry is, is kind of guilty of that. I mean, for the longest time, it was very, very conservative and it was, it was walnut and steel. Sure. You know, I mean, that's guns were made out of steel and wood, you know, or bug food as I call it. So, um, <laughs> that's true, you know, and it's just, uh, and even in the commercial market, I mean, if, if you bought a, a Winchester, pump action shotgun in 1952 it was pretty much what you bought in 1987 sure you know, i mean it was it wasn't too much that changed maybe a little more polymer in here but that's just how the industry was and then all of a sudden wham when everybody became very interested in uh military style rifles uh the history of them uh where they were uh in history to where they were going in the future i yeah. mean it was just uh all of a sudden this huge interest uh, jumped up. So um, growing up as a kid, I was saw everything was just uh, static for so long. And then wham, all of a sudden it's like, hey, let's get space age. There's all these new materials and new techniques and new manufacturing processes and stuff. Let's use them, mm -hmm. especially in the car industry. Mm -hmm. You saw a lot of that stuff in the car industry. It's like, Let's, you know, bring it into the gun industry. So uh, right. our bumpers are plastic now instead oh, yeah. of I mean, it, in, quarter inch intake steel. manifolds, oil pans, yeah. you know, valve covers, everything that was stamped steel or yeah. cast back in the day is now the latest space age, you know, technologies uh, and polymers. So, so that's kind of where we came from with this. You know, we looked at uh, uh, molding one piece uh, plastic body that had been done like, like in the Israeli ore lights or the Canadian thermals or anything. It was just... You know, a magazine is, is a box. All it does is store ammunition. The, the thing that does the work is the feed lips, right? So that's the most important part of a magazine. The rest of it is just there to hold your ammunition. Your gun is only as good as the feed lips. Uh, so uh, taking a magazine, trying to fill this entire one piece body, by the time the material is finally forced into these little tiny thin feed lips, material's already starting to set up. There's already stresses uh, being uh, uh, pushed into the uh, polymer as, as, uh, as it's uh, created. It was just a lot of different things. Uh, we figured, okay, well, uh, if we cut it in half and do uh, a real short, hot, fast shot, we're gonna feed the, uh, fill out the feed lips immediately. And there's no stress. There's a lot of structural integrity in there. And then, um, then the lower half, it's like, well, if we make it a five-sided box, that's pretty strong, you know, certainly stronger than a, than a four-sided. Mm -hmm. So we thought, well, we'll eliminate the floor plate. Why do we need the floor plate? You know, replace the spring. Well, wait a minute. If we use a really good spring, um, I mean, they're still finding loaded magazines from World War II. You know, they'll shove them in a gun and, and they work. So the springs don't, you know, if unless they're hyperextended or hi hypercompressed past their engineering limit, they'll live indefinitely. The so feed this, lips are the weak, weak link. Of so the this magazine, if I buy a, a box of these magazines, I'm not going to go out and shop for springs. This is all. No, that's it. it. it it's it a sealed unit. It comes together unless I smash it apart. Absolutely. It's okay. a sealed unit. Okay. It's fused together. Uh, uh, the follower's perforated. If anything falls in, it falls right out. Uh, if you shoot it, about that. shoot it suppressed and you get it completely filthy, throw it in a bucket of hot soapy water. Uh, you can take a mag brush, a couple strokes, and you're done. Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, it's good to go. How much uh, testing have you done, like longevity? Uh, volumes, volumes. We, it's thousands gone to and thousands of, of cycles. Absolutely. If not towards the millions, we've got independent test lab reports. You know, we did ran through cycle that for like three or four years. I mean, uh, infield testing, mill units, law enforcement. I mean, when we first descent, when the, the Gen 1 Max came out, we had some geometry issues. Um, they wouldn't function in all guns, you know, because... Um, Tolerances didn't, it, it were not the well, same there's, across the Well, there's the the, uh, the mill TDP for the M4s, so okay. the M16s and everything else. So you can, you, you all the information is there, but... Uh, since that's held by whoever supplies uh, military weapons to the U.S. government, everybody else has to kind of reverse engineer it. Sure. So a lot of commercial guns are, you know, dimensionally, they're completely different. So you have to uh, open up your tolerances and dimensions to make sure that it'll run in everything. So that's, you know, we stumbled out of the gate on that. How many years ago did you guys launch the first generation? This went out in uh, 2008. Okay, yeah. so it's been yeah. quite a while. Yeah. 
Yeah, it has. So if somebody's going to go invest a few hundred bucks in a box of magazines, why yours over any other plastic polymer magazine? I know you just told us some reasons, but like, yeah. you know. Uh, durability, it's, it's a very stout magazine. Uh, the, the material that we use in the upper half of that magazine is, is, a, is a very, very expensive uh, engineered polymer uh, that's unlike any other magazine polymer. And uh, it's very expensive, so you know we're not going to be able to give you the cheapest magazine, but we're going to give you the most reliable and robust mag there is. I see this polymer all, magazine all the so. time. The butcher shop in the town I grew up in, the sign over the the butcher counter says, "Good meat's not cheap. Cheap meat's not good." <laughs> it's stuck in my head from the time I was a boy. So yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's I, a good way I, of looking at I it. I dig yeah. it. I'm yeah. going to have to grab some of these and try them. I, yeah, you know, absolutely. I, I didn't even know, and I feel feels bad about it. Yeah. I didn't even know you guys made them until I saw them when I was in yeah. the office here yeah. with you. They uh, tell you what, it feels really smooth and like, uh, what's the word I would describe? Like, I don't want to say tight, but it, that you don't feel like things moving around. It right. feels smooth and right. just... Yeah. Uh, we've, uh, we've got a new version that's going to be coming out pretty soon. This is the Mark II. We're going to be coming out with a Mark III. Uh, the military has switched to a new round. It's the 855A1. It's got an exposed uh, tungsten penetrator. Okay. Uh, so uh, any magazine that runs at the, the feed lips have to make sure that this round hits high on the uh, feed ramps in the weapon system. Okay. Because if not, it'll start eating out Wearing the upper receiver. Yeah, yeah. So it's... Uh, so we're updated that. We've done... Uh, we've made it uh, a little more sexy. And... Uh, uh, we've revised a, a, a couple more little improvements in it that okay. I'll, I'll keep that in the bag till it's released. But how long people are going to be really out? happy? It's March now, the beginning of March. When do you think? We're hoping to have uh, probably end of summer. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And you guys got a bunch of stuff. I have some of these on one of my carbines. Your uh, yeah. your optic covers here. Talk yeah. about that a little bit. Yeah, the IO cover. We uh, um, partnered up with a gentleman by the name of Joe Chin. Uh, Another uh, product designer, really good guy. Uh, he initially came up with a design for uh, the aim points and um, uh, needed a boost to get it produced. So we uh, worked with him, got it, uh, got it into the marketplace pretty quickly, and then uh, started developing them for uh, other optics as well. We did them for the T1s, the T2 aim points, uh, probably the best uh, of the best as far as aim points are concerned mm -hmm. out there, yeah. our favorite models. Uh, uh, then we did one for uh, Trigigon for the MROs. Yep. That was kind of uh, uh, price point wise, it was uh, certainly less expensive than these, but definitely needed protection. Again, they had nothing, no bikini covers or anything. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's been a real big hit. In fact, we OEM them to uh, Trigicon. Uh, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. And then. Um, uh, we have a really good uh, relationship with Aimpoint as well. We're uh, doing uh, mount plates for the uh, new Acro P1. Yeah, I was just checking that out. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. This one here is the yeah is the plate itself. I'll get a close up of this. Yeah. For Drew to edit in here, but yeah, uh, steel fits right in the MRO. Yeah. I'm sorry. The uh, uh, help me. Uh, the uh, Glock MOS system. Yes, MOS. Yeah. I'm talking all these optics. Yeah. It fits right on the plate. And yeah. And there's the uh, the Acro right there. So we've uh, we've done the uh, Glock MOS plate. Uh, we make them out of 4140 barrel steel. We uh, heat treat them. Uh, the Glock plates are melanited. Uh, now we've uh, started developing them for the uh, the Sig 320 line, uh, for the X5s, uh, the Legion. The M17s, the M17 commercial models. Uh, we're doing a couple different plates. That one has no backup iron sight on it, just for operators that just want to run the optic. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and we're doing another plate that has a uh, backup iron sight in it. We're working with uh, Wilson Combat on that, so that's uh, they'll be supplying the sights uh, that'll dovetail right into the the plate that we're making. So. Uh, uh, you know, we like great relationships with great companies. Makes you know, sense to under, me. You know, it's just we're not uh, the kind of company that's like, no, we're going to do it all under our roof and nobody else is going to, you know, get the interest or, you know. We're it's just, hard it's to just, do. Uh, yeah, it really is. I mean, you know, uh, why reinvent the wheel? Sure. You know, and I'd rather make friends than make enemies. My so, wife uh, always says uh, pigs get fat and hogs get slaughtered. Yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's, 
Yeah. That's true. You guys do triggers too. We do triggers. We do triggers for the Glock. That's our carry trigger. Uh, uh, actually, that uh, that's the MOS. So that's our pro trigger. We don't. We sell that to law enforcement. The uh, pro. Yeah, the pro trigger. It's uh. So this one's not commercially available. It's not. It so all of the take up bad. is out of the trigger. Well, it's you know. Uh, we hear some sentiment from people going, ooh, you know, you only sell to law enforcement and you should be selling to us. It's like, be careful what you ask for because uh, that particular... Um, okay, so this one, you've got no slack in the trigger at all. You're well, that's the... Uh, oh, yeah, that's uh, the MOS. That Yeah, there's all of the take-up is out of that. So any pressure on that trigger, then goes loud. Uh, it's very fast. I mean... Uh, Versus when it comes to one. killing a plate rack, man, I'm just nothing is quicker. Yeah, that's our carry trigger, so that's uh, more of the uh, standard Glock uh, geometry. So there's, you have that take up, then you hit the what's called the wall, and that's just a, it's a good place for you to know that okay, anything past this, it gets loud. So uh, it's good for law enforcement, good for carry. If you, God forbid, you do have to go to court overshooting, you know, then it's not going to go, oh, you have the assassin trigger and you're done. You know, it's like, hey, it's a flat face, but everything, any expert witness will tell you, hey, everything's uh, lines up with the Glock geometry, so it's not, um, you know, an assassination device. So, you know, every round you fire has got a little attorney attached to it. So we Very we're true. aware of that when it comes to putting stuff out for street pistols. So we, uh, uh, we keep that in mind. It feels good. It is. The flat like face it. is real comfortable. Um, you have uh, a little mechanical advantage by putting your, you're now able to put your uh, finger lower on the trigger, so you have better mechanical advantage. You, there's a perception of a lighter trigger pull, even though mechanically it's the same. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, uh, being all alum injection molded uh, uh, nylon, it doesn't get hot like aluminum. Okay. You know, um, uh, it has the exact same uh, design in it, uh, trigger safety design as Glocks. Okay. So it's not going to pack up on you. There's no little metal coil springs or something that's going to die at some point. Uh, uh, it's been a really, really good seller for us, and we do them for the uh, Gen 3s, 4s, Gen 5s, slimline pistols. Uh, it's, it's a really, really good economical trigger for under $40. Oh, wow. You know, you've got something that some companies get, you know, $150 for, you know. It feels good. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It connects right to your standard Glock trigger bar. Um, and then you still have your choice of connectors. You can, you know, you can go hyper on it. You can polish everything out and, and really get a superb feel or just run it as is. So mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's up to the owner. I so, dig it. Yeah. Let's change gears a little bit. All righty. I talking, was talking with another buddy a couple of days ago. I do some political stuff. And he made a comment that uh, companies like yours, he didn't say you specifically, but companies that, that are in this business mm -hmm. need to kind of figure it out and galvanize uh, uh, Second Amendment movements to save our country. We were talking mm -hmm. outside, and then you just mentioned it again. As a kid in California, you took a bolt-action rifle to school. Now you'd be the poster child of a oh, child yeah. criminal. And, sure. <laughs> and be locked up for sure. even... even saying it would get you in trouble, let yeah. alone doing it. Yeah. Um, different world. Like what, what, what um, we got crazy lawsuits uh, in, in high courts trying to put the uh, burden on makers for things that happen yeah. with their products. Yeah. That's scary, scary stuff. Yeah. Like what do you as a manufacturer, a producer of products that sold both to the civilian market as well as the law enforcement. The law enforcement is civilian. I always remind you guys of that. But the non-military world. Yeah. Um, what you know? What do you feel? Your you, do you owe anybody anything any different than a, than if you were just uh, selling donuts? Yeah, not there's a, loaded, a not a loaded question. I just yeah. Well, it's the the primary thing. The first and last uh, thing that we consider when we're initially designing product to when we drop the final product into packaging and get it ready to ship is every single product we trust our life to, you know, so that's, that's God's own law. So that's first and foremost, mm -hmm. you know, just as, as the right to self-defense, somebody doesn't guarantee you that you have that naturally. Mm -hmm. God gave you that right. Uh, 
uh, nobody can take that away from you. They can try. They can try, poli- <laughs> yeah. they can try politically, but you know it's up to your personal fortitude to see what when that line gets crossed. Yeah. But uh, so anyway, that's how it is. Is basically our first products are going out to the military. It's our thoughts were always on some guy on a mountaintop in Afghanistan, and what if that product breaks? Where does that leave that guy? You know, all the way down to our just the more fun products that we do for the commercial market. It's the same thing. It's like, you know, and then if something does happen, how will we take care of that person? Mm -hmm. It's like, you can always reach us by phone and we'll, our customer service, we pride ourselves on our customer service, taking care of anybody, no matter what, you know, uh, it extends way through the sale. Even if it's the least expensive part that we make, it doesn't matter. The principle is the same. Mm -hmm. Um, but when it comes to the uh, Second Amendment uh, part of that, it's like, you know, we're uh, obviously, we're here in Tucson, Arizona. It's uh, doesn't get much free. It, it doesn't. I mean, that. here in Arizona, it's illegal if you don't have a gun. <laughs> you know, so, you know, and uh, so we try to get involved in, in, in the uh, shooting community out here as far as uh, uh, supporting instructors, uh, you know, anybody that we can, you know, politically out here that uh, uh, make people aware that uh, even in Arizona is, is, with the liberties and freedoms that we have, I mean, it's a, it's a concealed carry state. You don't have to have a permit to carry concealed here, uh, even for out-of-state people. I mean, that's, that's a few states that are like that, but mm-hmm. it's a wonderful thing. So we enjoy that and we want to make sure it stays this way. And, and uh, even with state legislatures we've seen what what's happened in virginia mm-hmm. and how somebody can come in with a whole bunch of money and and buy a different outcome yep. politically yep. you know yep. and it, that can happen here yeah it's like sure. i'm sure as we're being eyed is is you know we need to do something with those pesky arizona people those gun people so mm-hmm. yeah so you guys kind of everybody's migrating here i've got a friend from california yeah. i don't want to say his name because he hasn't announced his move but he's moving his company yeah. from southern california to I think right here in this town, actually, yeah. you know, as we speak, and that's we're hiring people yeah. from California. I mean, it's uh, and it's, Ernest Langdon's here, yeah, yeah. Apex Ernest is Langdon's here, here. Ruger's here, uh, Voltor, Abrams, uh, Milcor, Dillon, here. yeah, it's. Uh, uh, and then, then you got big distributors too, like Davidsons and sure, you know, all, all those guys are all the way to Raytheon. I mean, yeah. all, all every missile that we shoot off an aircraft is is made here in Tucson. I didn't I, know that. I've toured uh, uh, military bases in Italy and everything else, and uh, seen tornadoes with uh, uh, or you know wearing Tucson missiles. Cool. So, yeah. So it's kind of a neat thing. So, um, but what can like what can you, we go to SHOT Show, right? I th- this is what I think about as a guy that's worked in politics. I see all of these booths and businesses, and we're all there for commerce, right? Yeah. We're there to, like you said a minute ago, you got a phone ringing right now. You said you made a joke about capitalism. And, and I think, man, what if we could just galvanize even like one-tenth of the decision makers in this event to actually do something outside of any other three-letter organization, but to do something. And it, yeah. I don't mean like, you know, riot or anything like that, but educate and 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 uh, uh, try to drive a narrative that yeah. rather than complain on Facebook, you know, right, writing, right, right. writing stupid BS and yeah. showing up dressed in full battle rattled uh, to events, yeah. you know, not being a good representative of... of well, that's not a good representative for me. It might be a good representative for others. Yeah. Uh, um, one trend I've seen that's real disturbing is a lot of uh, anti-law enforcement sentiment mm. by the uh, shooting community just online. Yeah, I, I mean, see it, that too, man. That's weird. I, I've noticed that. I, I, in the last, uh, I don't know, three to four months, uh, um, I've seen more and more of it pop up, and it's very polarizing, and it's it's stupidity, number one, and it's... And it's usually over products. It's again. It's like, oh, they they sold that to law enforcement. I should be able to have that. It's like, it, it's not because they don't like you. It, you know, it's like, uh, do you perform counterterrorism every single day? Do, I mean, you sure. know, I'm sure you love to drive, but do you have a Formula One car in your garage? You know, it's just, you, you wouldn't be able. What fun would it be unless you have a racetrack and you're up against other teams mm-hmm. competing? You know, it's. It just blows me away that 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 you would, the first responders, the guys that would run to your rescue, you're trashing them. 
because they got weird. different kit than you do, you know? And yeah, it's, and, a, uh, it's a strange argument, and I, I I understand where the most of them are young men are coming from. Like yeah. the Second Amendment means I should be able to own that missile that, from Raytheon. That's what it means to them. I think okay, yeah. you got the thirty-eight million dollars to go buy one or yeah. whatever yeah. it costs. Right? I mean, <laughs> it's like it's like full auto. It's like uh, it's even when you first you know move to a place where you can own something like that and you shoot you know, select fire. And it's like, after about a week, you're kind of going, okay, hold on with that. And I can't afford to feed the Yeah, thing. I'm just converting money into a noise. And it's just, you know, uh, it's, and then you're less precise. Mm -hmm. You know, when you should be focusing on the fundamentals and becoming more precise, you're actually kind of going the other direction. What, what, but, what made but, you bring up the law enforcement? Why'd that pop in your head? Well, when you talk about getting people together and, yeah. and, and, and just and, and it kind of felt like trends, you, were, you were seeing this or describing yeah, this you, cultural what, shift. What triggered it was when you're saying you went online and you're seeing a lot of sentiment online, and and, and I started seeing that as well. Mm -hmm. And then and you're thinking, why is this? Somebody yeah. will comment on YouTube on this video. One of you's thinking about it right now. If yeah. you do it, go ahead because I'll push delete. Keep yeah, and, and you look at you look at what's going on in Virginia, and look at all of the law enforcement that are hanging their necks out. All yeah. these sheriffs, and in all of these counties and everything else, they're forming up, you know, uh, Second Amendment sanctuary areas. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in law enforcement, there's a lot of pressure from the city councils, counties, and everything else. It's like, whoa, wait a minute, that was just Second Amendment protection. Right. You know, I mean, they're facing a lot of pressure. Those are the groups that determine that. You know uh, that paycheck. You mm -hmm. know, so I mean, they're. You know, bear that in mind next time you start pounding on law enforcement. It's like those are the guys that are going to refuse to to round up the guns and everything else. Sure. I mean, you know, the feds. That's a different deal. But local law enforcement, they're you. That's your community. Right. You know. So, yeah, I I, I hope people start to lose that attitude because it's just that's just wrong. It really is. I, I'm noticing it, this. Uh, this divide of us and them and my opinion's always been like there is no them it's me yeah. my representative i put there right either by my hard work or my inaction like they're there because of me and my neighbors allowing them to go there or we voted them there yeah and the mayor the co uh, police chief or the sheriff we hire and, and elect all those people and i yeah. i don't say it like tongue in cheek like like they work for us like they literally do mm -hmm. and we can remove them if we want to but yeah. it seems like the same folks that have all that bashing don't fully embrace that part of being an american that you can do that i'd agree with that yeah. i would i mean it's like again going back to virginia the situation they have is a lot of people didn't get out and vote yeah. Right. And then all of a sudden, bam, it got dropped in their lap and they're going, shit, my lap's on fire. I got to deal with this. Yeah. You know, and then they thankfully started to deal with it, but it never should have happened to begin with. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what happens when we get complacent. I, and, I don't think I said this to you earlier, but a young man messaged me. He's in Nebraska. He sent me a photo of uh, he was in their capital and you could see some people in there, maybe a few hundred folks. And he said, I don't know what happened. This is our like second amendment lobby day. I called everybody. I sent messages to like the big Instagram people and like nobody did anything. Yeah. And I said, well, that's the challenge, man. Like that is the problem. And I said, you were hoping cause these guys have followers or, or training businesses that they were going to stick their neck out for you in, in Omaha or Lincoln or wherever you were. Yeah. Um, but everybody leaves the task to somebody else. Yeah. You know, um, sadly, we've had it too good for too long. You know, yeah. there's a lot of countries that they would love uh, the right to assemble somewhere and voice their opinions mm. instead of getting hit with water cannons and, and uh, rubber bullets and everything else. Yeah. Over here, the rest of the world must look at us, you know, uh, in those less than social countries. And they're going, you, are you guys crazy? You're not exercising that right, mm -hmm. you know? And then they're, uh, you know. There's a comedian on Netflix I watched a couple days yeah. ago. He's from uh, Taiwan. And he's making a joke about how as a kid, that his family thought, like, I just got to get to America. And they come here and he realized, and it's a hilarious stand-up uh, routine, but he's talking about napkins. Mm -hmm. And he said in his country, you know, they don't waste anything. They don't have this stuff or they didn't when he was a kid to yeah. waste things. And he goes, here, we're, you know, he just like 
take a handful of napkins like you'd make in front of like a rapper throwing dollar bills and he's just yeah, like yeah. napkin 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 nice. and you know you're just like do you need a napkin yeah. sure and you just throw them out your car window <laughs> on the ground you know and that's and we and yeah. i'm laughing if humor is always funny when it's based in reality yeah, and we right. do that you know you yeah, go to the yeah. movie theater i might need some of those and you grab like four inches of sure. napkins sure. you know we all do it <laughs> Open but, the car door on anybody's car door, and it's like there's like yeah, this much sta- McDonald's sta- napkins in there. Yeah, yeah, right, of course, yeah. right. But it was as I watched that and was listening to him, I'm like thinking, like, man, yeah. like that's how I don't I don't want to say soft, but just removed from the struggle of of existence, where everything we were talking about California earlier, yeah, like yeah. there's there's so many nets to catch us when we fall now that yeah. people don't have to be hard. Yeah. Well, growing up in California, I saw the political situation change. It was just like, um, it started happening. I think uh, the the biggest thing was there was a, a shooting in Stockton. A guy shot up a school, hmm. schoolyard, killed a lot of kids with it. I, I think what it was in the... What year was that? It was in the late, late 80s, I believe it was. Okay. And, uh, and, um, California, that started the ball rolling in California, and it started rolling very quickly. Got to protect all the of kids. A sudden it was, you got to stop was, the crazies. There was a lot of shootings after that, you know. And he shot it with a, with a, with the uh, an AK. Okay. And uh, AK style rifle, and then right after that there was a shooting in uh, San Diego in a McDonald's. Guy with a semi-auto Uzi shot that up. So it was, it was strange because it just it was a short rash of these, you know, mass shootings with, uh, you know, military-style guns. And then everything flipped. I mean, it was people couldn't track it. Strange in the sense that somebody might look at that and say, bizarre that these instances happened, and all of a sudden we have this... Uh, and then, bam, the, it, it was just like instantly, and then... But they had... It was almost like there was a lot of preparation for that. It was like the mindset was already in place mm-hmm. for the argument. So... You know, laws just started getting passed, and it was like then magazine restrictions, you know, weapon restrictions. California was the first state that passed the, uh, you know, basically a ban on military-style rifles, and it was and it was a list. They listed the name. It was like you know a Fowl or an FNC yeah. or or a Colt or you know with the model number and everything else. And then that's where the creativity started coming with the gun industry. It's like, well, we won't call it the the Colt blah 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 it's anymore. Bear. It's yeah. like, yeah, yeah, yeah we'll yeah, call yeah. it you know the Colt Sporter or something. Yeah, you know, so yeah, it was yeah. just. And then we'll put a thumb hole stock and everything else. So that's where that cat and mouse started getting played to where they were starting to outrun the legislators. I never liked that cat and mouse. Like, why should we have to do that? So rather than invest our energy in like redesigning stocks so we could put the thumb hole, invest your energy in putting that group of lobbyists and lawmakers out of business. Yeah. You know, that's how my brain usually works. Yeah, you know, it's just, but you could see where the, what one side was calling a loophole, the other side was going, well, that's compliance. Yeah. You know, so it's like, you know, are we going to keep doing this till we, you know, get melted by the sun? It's like, come on, this is just, this is silly. Kind of like our president and people complaining about taxes, his income taxes, like he just... Use the tax code that was there. And yeah, his accountants absolutely. were sharp. Yeah, yeah it doesn't. Make if he wasn't paying his taxes, IRS would have something to say about that, and he'd right. probably be punching license plates. Right. So it's right. like, you know, what are we doing here? So, yeah. And then, uh, then the nation took it over. You know, then, uh, then the crime bill, nineteen ninety four. They modeled everything on California. Mm-hmm. So, and uh, that was scary. Yeah, it was. And then, uh, and then, it, did it solve crime? Not at all. I mean, that was the the basis for the for the crime bill, supposedly. Something I must interject. There's a lot of young dudes that are now 20s, 30s that don't remember that. Yeah. And they, like right now, we're about as free as we've been in 30, 40 years with guns and suppressors and all this cool stuff. And I don't, the argument isn't like, thank you government for letting us have it, but just in 94 to... 2004, yeah. you couldn't have any of this stuff. It was some real dark times. It really yeah. was. It was, uh, uh, and it was tough for anybody in the defense industry. If you're trying to generate, like I remember Reed and I, it, you know, um, going back and forth for demonstrations with the military and this and that. It's like he really had to be, oh, let's see, do I have any high cap max? You know, I mean, mm. everything, you know, he had to monitor everything that you had and make sure he had all the paperwork and everything else in case, you know, you're pulled over or, 
or came under inspection. So uh, it's just boxes of my Glock 19 and 17 mags are the mill only. Right. I mean, I only I got them after the fact, but yeah. a company that inventoried them to sell the PDs after the fact was like, well, you know, get rid of them. No, not, they thought they didn't want them. I said, well, you know, yeah, give them right? like eight bucks a piece. I'll oh, take yeah. them by the case. You yeah, know? yeah. But folks don't understand how that happened, and they don't think it can happen again. So I don't know. I don't. Maybe I'm. I, maybe I'm uh, spitballing in the wrong direction. But it just seems to me like if you got, uh, and, th and this has been tried before in some ways, companies like Radiant Weapons they foot the bill six figures out in Oregon to fight uh, yeah. their assault weapons uh, BS. They yeah. literally they said, okay, we can. They've got a beautiful manufacturing facility there. They said we can pack up and move to Idaho or somewhere else. Yeah, that'd probably be their and, closest uh, refuge. But they said yeah. if we, you know, if we costed it out, just the cost for mill rights to move all of their CNC machines and to yeah. reacquire uh, new office space. Look at all the jobs they're leaving behind, and they got to go back out, and they got to mm -hmm. rehire, they got to retrain, and they said we'll invest yeah. the same amount of capital into fighting. So they, yeah. you know, it was like a hundred and something thousand dollars. They wrote a check to yeah. to pay for lawyers and put, brought buses of people to the capital to fight yeah. it, and they won. Yeah, and that. And that's a gamble, and not every company has a hundred plus thousand dollars. No, no, and it, it it shouldn't have to go that far. No, you know it should it should have been stopped a lot earlier than that. But uh, but what if a hundred companies got together and did? You know, there's I, the NRA and other organizations. They've got, and I'm a, a staunch NRA supporter and have been for years. But they've got um, too much fat in them in a lot of ways. Where the yeah. The finances and, and the energy <clears throat> is going to, in a lot of ways, proliferate the organization, not proliferate yeah. the, the cause of the organization. Yeah, they're getting a, uh, a wake-up call, that's for sure. Yeah. You know, it's just, uh, um, I think, politics being what they are, um, there's new ways of attacking. I mean, you look at just how far politicians once upon a time there used to be kind of a civility and you would only say there's only certain things you could say as a politician and now it's like you look you know tune into any news channel at night and it's it's unbelievable there's just absolute you know lunatics yeah, they're just uh the, some of the stuff that they're saying and how polarizing and and uh uh and hinting at you know these dire consequences if you don't fall in with me politically mm -hmm. and it's just it's it's crazy it so is. and they're and you look at uh, attorney generals now in all these different states that are, you know, uh, they're putting a dagger and they've got a dagger in their teeth and they're going after people like yeah. NRA that yeah. in ways that never would have been contemplated before. So it's, you know, Obama NRA, did that a little bit too. Yeah. His, his, you know, AG office did that. They went after some uh, religious organizations. Yeah, and, absolutely. And, and then fast and furious. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was generated in, in, uh, in Eric Holder, I think is one of the biggest criminals, uh, ever uh, uh to wear the title politician mm. and, and attorney general i think he's the guy should definitely be in jail i mean uh brian terry was killed here and just outside of tucson and that's that's a big thing yeah it is for us here in in arizona still and uh border patrol uh uh will never let that go you know i think they're they're those feelings towards eric Holder are always going to be there and uh that's why we're so wary of, you know, federal government. And, uh, it's just, I don't know. It's sad times, you know. Uh, so, so can guys like you and me and others that have uh, voices in certain areas collectively get together and change something? I guess that's the question, and the bandwidth has to be there for people. You know, you get, you get like one guy over here with his idea yeah. and this guy with his idea and you're all going in kind of different directions it just seems like hey can't we all get on the same ship here and i hope so because you know when you think about it everybody's kind of concerned with their own we've become really kind of tribal you yeah. know it's like once upon a time everybody was more united as a nation we were united and now everything's you know getting divvied up and it's like we shouldn't allow that to happen and when it comes to the second amendment people are you know, it's like, well, they're just icky guns. Let's just get rid of the guns. It's like, no, you don't get it. That's mm. the Second Amendment. That guarantees the rest of them. You know, it guarantees your First Amendment. Right? And I like it's icky like, guns. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. So, so it's like, just think about that. It was just like, like uh, firearms manufacturers being able to sue them 
for the acts of a, of a customer. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, what if that was to be applied to the automotive industry yeah. or anything? It was like, it will be because well, the minute the gun industry that falls, then it's it's why the man those demons are out of the gate, mm -hmm. and every single portion of our lives it's going to be infected by that. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, same with the Second Amendment. It's like you know, okay, maybe you're not a big of a shooter or anything else, but man, you better think about you know letting that fall. This country is over the minute the Second Amendment goes away. It is so. It yeah, is. It would go. It would go completely yeah. to another place that absolutely that this experiment never was meant to be. Yeah. 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 And that's why. Do you do you uh, do you have plans for the future? Like you know, you're gonna explode this thing to to be like tango down worldwide, crush everybody that makes anything remotely like it. You no, got, no. You got a no. steady course ahead of you. We are. We we enjoy our customer base, who we deal with. Uh, we have phenomenal customers, um, whether it's military, commercial, law enforcement. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, uh, we're having fun. I mean, we're, uh, hey, we're solving problems. It, it keeps us motivated every single day. It, how long have, uh, have you been a business owner? I know you, how, we, you've been doing Tango Down for 20-ish years, but... Uh, yeah, uh, did you Tango... Work, did you work for yourself before that? No, I was well? in the corporate world before okay. that. Yeah, okay. so, so uh, corporate design. Uh, when I got out of design school, I actually went to work for Toyota. Oh, I was an executive designer at Toyota. And, uh, um, but firearms have always been, you know, just a fun thing to do. And uh, uh, when you have a passion for something, it gives you a little bit of an edge for the guy that's just getting a paycheck. Yeah. So yeah, when you'll stay later and you'll work longer. Making and, widgets yeah. that you don't care yeah. about. Yeah, I mean you're you know you're personally involved in it, you know. So any advice to uh, young entrepreneurs, dudes, or dudettes trying to break into any business as a as a guy that's done uh, with it any for... business, it's like stick with it. I mean, there's statistically, if you look at you know most small businesses that get started, they fail within just a few years. You know, if you make it past the five year mark, then it's odds are that you're probably going to make it. You know, but you just if you really truly want it and you're really hungry. You know, keep grinding, keep grinding. Yeah, you know, that's that's another edge that because if five people start small businesses, three of them are going to fall away because eh, I'm, today I feel like, oh, I'm going to be a dancer. You know, I mean, it was just, you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, it's just, yeah. you know, it, they weren't really that motivated. It was kind of the cool thing. Maybe stuff lined up to where they could get started and do it. But then when the going got a little bit hard and yeah, I'm on to something else. They folded. Yeah, they fold. So. That's something I brought that up because, folks, I look at all the stuff you've done here, the nice facility, all these parts that are on all these these uh, well-known guns, and it's becoming a, it's a pretty I I iconic uh, name in this business now. Like my friend Ben from Boresight Solutions, who's one of the finest uh, polymer gunsmiths out there. Yeah. In my opinion, he's the best. Yeah, it's your parts. He yeah. you know he puts on not. Not somebody else's, so yeah. that you know that means something. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very pleasing to us too. I mean, we we OEM to a lot of gun companies, and uh, we've got great relationships with uh, all of the big companies. You know, we're OEM supplier to FN for the SCAR program, and and H and K for the 416, and, uh, and now Geisley. We're doing a lot of stuff for Geisley. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. which is uh, you were telling us about that polymer oh, products. For which them. we should look at that part real quick. Yeah. Uh, this guy here, right? Ah. We pulled the uh, the buttstock off of there because that's not something that you can show right now, yeah, right? Right. But, but uh, we're doing a lot of nice parts for Geisley. We're doing these uh, uh, M-Lock handguard uh, rail panels that are uh, very, very grippy. They wanted something uh, extremely grippy, something that would just click into place, something you could get on and off very quickly without breaking them. Um, you just use the tip of your knife to undo the lever, take the panels off. Uh, and they feel good. They're like uh, they're like a, uh, a aggressive stipple, is what I would. It's do. almost like a cat's tongue, you know. It's yeah, just really, exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, really, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's not it's not sharp or it's like uh, painful. Um, yeah, it just yeah. sticks to you. It's yeah. tsh, like it's a nice like the rough side of Velcro. Yeah. We are uh, doing M-lock style hand guards, or I mean uh, uh, vertical foregrips that'll fit on uh, M-lock hand guards. Uh, it's got a neat little attachment mechanism, just one little fastener, and uh, you can uh, 
get it on and off the weapon system. Cool. Uh, we're doing uh, rifle grips uh, for Geisley. We're going to start doing a, hopefully a family of those. Uh, we've got a buttstock that's pretty cool. Uh, that's our uh, PR4 uh, single point sling mount. We did this uh, for the Marine Corps years ago. Uh, they wanted to be able to uh, put a single point sling mount on their guns without the armors having to uh, disassemble the weapon. They okay. Could, they could put them on in theater and uh, it was good to go. Uh, then law enforcement jumped on it too. So uh, we've sold a ton of these to the Corps. It's both and, sides in the bottom. Yeah, there's actually a, a rear port. Okay, in the and back. there's one on either side. Okay. The, the rear one's nice with a single point. It, and you don't actually to, nothing has to get taken off. You just clamp it just, right over the two. Yeah, four fasteners. You tighten it on, then you take it off. The clamping force is insane. Uh, and then uh, it's below the castle nut, so you don't have to worry about your charging handle hitting it. Uh, we did the the initial one was for the uh, M16s. Uh, oh, really? A2s, yeah, we did them a uh, version for the A2. Then uh, then we did them for the M4s, and that was like a huge hit. And then, uh, uh, and then, uh, yeah, then we're doing a, a complete new buttstock for modular buttstock for Geisley. So, which was cool. I'm yeah, interested. It'll be interesting to see when that hits the market space. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, having seen the models and worked them, you'll uh, you'll be pleased with the final production parts. And you've so. got some stuff. I was taking some pictures of this. This is the new Glock 44. You're doing stuff on this already. This yeah, we uh, like I said, we got a really good relationship with Glock, so they sent us uh, uh, one of the first uh, 44s, and then uh, so we could see exactly what our existing uh, Glock uh, product line would fit the uh, the 44s, and we were pleasantly surprised. This pistol is basically a 19, mm -hmm. so uh, uh, the frame is identical to an, uh, a Gen 5 19. The only difference is in the locking block area. Okay. These have a plastic locking block that drops in. Uh, but if you were to take it out, remove a bit of material, you could drop the steel uh, locking block out of a 19 into it and put a 19 away top end on it and away you go. But our, our triggers, magazine release, slide stop, floor plates uh, fit the, the pistol perfectly. Uh, the only uh, We have to have a slightly different slide racker for the okay. for the 44s, but uh, uh, Glock sent us out some of the uh, uh, threaded accessory uh, suppressor barrels, so we've got a little uh, Surefire 22 can on there, and it is a neat little piece, man. If you guys need an inexpensive, uh, high quality, very accurate 22, this is your gun. I, and then, I'm going to have to have one. Yeah, if you if you own other Glocks, you got to have this, mm -hmm. just because it's, everything's the same. Uh, they're very accurate, and they're just a hoot to shoot. So I'm afraid that when you call later to ask where it went, I have still yet to come up with a good story. Yeah, you better get creative. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you taking the time to uh, let us come by and visit and chat. And uh, it's always a pleasure. Thanks, yeah, man. Yeah, I often yeah. ask guys if you, uh, the folks listening or watching, if they never meet you in person or you never pass their way, what would you leave them with? Hmm. Well, uh, first and foremost, we talked about the Second Amendment, and that's protect that religiously. Do whatever you can because your future generations are counting on you to keep the door closed on, on any kind of uh, um, uh, oppression, any, any kind of moves on that Second Amendment. Because like I say, once that's gone, this country's gone. So mm -hmm. you owe it to uh, future generations to protect this country. So, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Hey, American-owned uh, company, American Stuff. It's like uh, sales auto parts, right? Yeah. American-made. Good stuff. Support, support brands like this, uh, not just because it's uh, cheaper, because if that's what you're looking for, you know I never share that stuff with you because yeah. it's the better idea, and you, you guys have dudes in the back that are supporting families and yeah. paying into the local economy, and those are the guys that are going to go out and fight for the... For, for the Second Amendment and for the, the cause of liberty. So I yeah. appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Mickey, it's always a pleasure. Thanks, man. Good seeing you, brother. Appreciate right. it. Yeah. Come by anytime. You guys share this video if it uh, was beneficial to you. I hope we gave you a little bit more insight rather than just the uh, gear videos that you're used to seeing on some of these products. And that's all I got. Don't be dickheads. Visit our website, carrytrainer.com for information about classes held throughout the U.S., Carry Trainer Apparel in upcoming projects. You can also email us at training at carrytrainer.com for information about setting up your own private course or speaking engagement. 
training at carrytrainer.com or carrytrainer.com.